My guest today played two different roles on Star Trek The Next Generation and is now a filmmaker and director. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Okay, guys, I have an incredible, incredible interview today. It was an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with my guest. As frequent listeners of the podcast will know, I am a hardcore Star Trek The Next Generation fan. I especially love the early seasons of the show. And my guest today played two roles on Star Trek The Next Generation that I love. So here's today's interview. My guest today is filmmaker John Putch. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It is my pleasure. Now, I just gave you a very short introduction because if I were to go into your credits, it would take up a good 20 minutes or so of our talk here today. You have a lot of credits between filmmaking and um, acting as well when you were younger. And so why don't you just kind of set the stage for us? I'll start off the puns because you come from a showbiz family, don't you? Yeah, and you only can get credits uh, if you're old enough. So, you know, I've been kicking around <laughs> long enough that I collect them. And also, word of advice, if you never uh, turn down a job, you'll have a lot of things. You'll have a lot of credits. <laughs> there you uh, go. No, I came from uh, a showbiz family. My father was a, a theater director and producer of his own Summerstock Theater. And my mom was an actress uh, who some of you might know as the uh, Jean Stapleton who played Edith Bunker on All in the Family. Mm -hmm. And my sister was also an actress and uh, until she went behind the camera as well. And we grew up in this little town in Pennsylvania uh, when we weren't in New York. Uh, where my father's theater was, and we all worked at it. It was called the Totem Pole Playhouse. It is still in existence, and it is still operating. Hmm. And uh, so we uh, we were kind of this little starving actor and uh, director family. And uh, when my mom uh, stopped working in New York and got a gig in California, which was the All in the Family show, you know, to much great success we uh we then became half the year out in california and half the year back east so we had theater in the summer and we had television in the winter and uh and that's how i got involved in in the tv world and the film world mm -hmm. yeah and you started acting very young right yeah uh you know it's when your father's a artistic director of a theater and you you're in the middle of nowhere really when you have kids putting them on stage is uh is the easiest thing to do and whenever we wanted to and he'd say hey i need you for i need you for george m or i need you to be the kids in in south pacific or 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 the king and i or something you know <laughs> and, and you know he'd say could you help me out for like you know two weeks and we go, yeah, okay. And then we became actors on stage and we got to experience that. So mm -hmm. uh, I started, yes, yeah, started out as an actor and uh, thought I was going to continue that. And when we made the transition to California living, uh, I still was pursuing acting and uh, I had a lot of theater experience and, and, you know, it worked pretty well in the sitcom world. And I worked my way into sitcoms uh, in the mid seventies. And when I was a really young boy and, uh, and continued to follow that path and work, uh, in television, I'd get jobs here and there and all through high school and junior high and all that stuff. And then I was always making films. So I'm, I'm putting it all together here. Sorry if this yeah. is boring, but it'll be over in a second. But, uh, dad gives me a movie camera when I'm a kid and, and he goes, you know, I think he did it to keep me out of trouble. He said, here. Get, get your buddies and you know go out and make some movies because uh, he used to do that for us as when we were young he would make mm -hmm. a film star us in it edit it together make a soundtrack and then we'd all sit and watch it together as entertainment this mm -hmm. is pre-internet and like we had three channels at that point <laughs> 
And uh, so, uh, you know, I started making Super 8 movies in high school and junior high. And, uh, you know, and then graduated to 16 millimeters and learned how learned to, you know, learn the mechanics of film making and uh, and then started going, hey, I like this. I should I'm going to try to direct something, you know, for for real. So I started, you know, hustling to get uh, jobs as a as a director and it took a long time to break t- into TV. But prior to that, I did a lot of little B independent stuff and cheapy Cormany type stuff, which, you know, they, anybody who could do it, they'd, they'd hire you because no one wanted to do it for no money and nobody wanted to do it in 10 or 12 days. So, except, you know, me, my hand shot up because I could get a shot at it. So, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of, you know, how I ended up, you know, behind the camera uh, and then phase the acting out pretty much once the directing work took over in terms of revenue and uh you know making a living i was able to stop being a actor on commercials and tv shows and stuff so so that's kind of where how i ended up where i am today and how how it's going to end for me <laughs> <laughs> all right well yeah thank you for that overview there sure. um i think that would be helpful for some people who are listening um uh, but now before we, you know, I do want to definitely talk about your directing and some storytelling and that here in a bit. Uh, before we do that, um, I definitely want to go back to some of your acting because, um, you know, I know you were in some shows that I watched when I was a kid. Um, I think, uh, was it One Day at a Time and, mm-hmm. and things like that? I remember you being in that show. But um, uh, one of the shows that really like transformed my life with star trek the next generation um sure. it came on the air when i was i think i was like 14 or 13 i think um when it first came on and uh you p- appeared in two episodes and uh people may not recognize you because you had on quite a bit of alien makeup um but you were in a couple episodes and you played uh, a benzite character in both of them you played a uh, mordock and ensign menden and um the first episode was coming of age and the second episode was a matter of honor and i i wanted just to kind of talk about that a little bit because um uh uh really like i said you know i was You know, as I mentioned before we were recording, you know, in college, I I studied filmmaking and screenwriting and that. And part of the reason was because I watched Star Trek The Next Generation all the time. Like, I wanted to figure out how they made these things. They were amazing. Of course, Star Wars was in there as well. And I just wanted to figure out, you know, how they made all of this stuff and and everything. Um, And so I want to kind of just, you know, before we move on a little bit, I I just kind of want to take us back to, uh, to those characters because... They really made an impression on me, and actually, coming of age is one of my favorite episodes still of the series. Um, and I'm not saying that because you're here with me now. <laughs> I'm saying that you know, for it's for real. Um, uh, and just kind of take us back to that, and like, how did you get on to uh, uh, Next Gen? And um, you know, how did how did you end up playing uh, Mordock in that first episode? I uh, <laughs> no, I love. Listen, when I you know when pre Star Wars. There was only one show and it was, you know, Star Trek Mm -hmm. and it was the original. And uh, I watched that, man, I was every time, every whatever night it was on, I was there. I saw them all. I just, you know, to end to end, head credits to tail credits. uh, It was just an amazing experience and um, couldn't believe that show. Uh, Loved it. And then, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, when they announced, you know, Next Generation, you know, and then the movies came. Thank mm-hmm. God they started making the movies and all the Star Trek fans were just, in, you know, up in arms over over that mm-hmm. and uh, c- just couldn't believe it. And, of course, Rafa Khan, you know, when that came out, yeah. it fixed it fixed the first one. You know, we yeah. were just all, oh, thank <laughs> God they let the TV division make, <laughs> you know, make the second Star Trek film. And it mm-hmm. was like, you know, it was incredible. And then, the, you know, off to the races. But when uh, so by the time. um you know, they announced we're going to, you know, next generation. It was, you know, everybody who was a Star Trek, you know, nerd, myself included, were, you know, we, we just couldn't believe it and couldn't wait for it. And I remember watching the premiere. I mean, it was on, it was weird because it was on a local uh, uh, channel in LA here that wasn't a major network. It was one of the smaller networks. Mm-hmm. It was on 
channel 13 here at KCOP or something. And, uh, and that, so that was a huge thing that it wasn't on ABC, NBC or Fox or something. Mm -hmm. So like everyone's watching that. And, uh, I was just stunned by it. Um, you know, it was, it became like, gotta watch it, gotta watch it. It's, it's a cult, you know, we were all in a cult at the time. And then, you know, <laughs> look, look at what, what happened to it. So anyway, I'm working as an actor out here in LA and, uh, you know, I'm making the rounds. I'm doing pretty good in the eighties. You know, I'm, I'm getting guest shots. I'm on a lot of television shows and you're making it sort of making a living using the money to make short films and stuff. And, uh, you know, my, one of my friends who was the casting director of that show, you know, brought me in, always brought me in on her projects. And this was one of them. So when, when, uh, you know, they were cast in the part of, uh, Mordock, the, in, uh, the first one, um, what was it called? Coming of age. Yeah. It, um, you know, I just went in and read. I mean, it was me and all the same guys I see in the room, uh, you know, up every day. It was the same group of guys reading for, you know, the the odd bird, you know, blue-headed guy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so you go in and you read, and there's like, two, there must have been 20 other guys there reading for the same thing and other parts and all this stuff. So, you know, I go through the process. I get a call. Like, anyway, so I get the part. And, um, okay. You're going to, you know, you got to go get a cast made and you're going to be an alien. And, you know, and they told you that, but you didn't, I didn't know to what extent, but I had to have a full, full head cast made, mm -hmm. you know, with the, uh, the straws, they stick up your nose, oh, you breathe. Mm -hmm. And like today I couldn't do it. I'd be, there's no way I'd be, I'd be too claustrophobic. I'd, you know, I have allergies now. I'd be afraid I couldn't breathe, you know, mm -hmm. because your mouth, they cover your mouth. They, they only let you breathe through your nose and they blop all this, you know, Michael Westmore blopping all this stuff on me <laughs> and making the head cast. And then they start building it anyway. So, um, then you come back weeks later and you start, you know, do the show, but it took, I don't know, five hours in may in the makeup chair for me every day. So my call was three 30 in the morning usually. Oh, wow. And I would get to paramount when a lot of people were like going home because mm -hmm. who were on late shoots and uh you know i'd lie in the chair and pretty much fall asleep and mm -hmm. wake up at 7 a.m go get in cost costume and now i walk onto the set and nobody knew what i looked like uh because i never mm -hmm. ever saw anybody outside of being in the blue headed alien makeup which was a full full headpiece it went in at the eyebrows went mm -hmm. all the way up over my head and down back over my neck mm -hmm. and it went down around the side of my ears and then all the other attachments were separate you know the tendrils the thumbs the the there was a uh, oh you know what it went down over my nose too it went okay. over from my nose all the way over my head and um yeah. So nobody really knew who I was. And like to this day, when I see Johnny Frakes, you know, I go, Hey, Frakes, it's Pudge. He goes, Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hardly recognize you, you know? Uh, but no, I had to, when I was done, I'd had to go back in, I'd go back in and like, look at all my friends from the day that I met, including, uh, you know, Will Wheaton. I go, this is me. It's me, you know, <laughs> this is what I look like. So yeah. I made sure of that, but anyway, uh, yeah. fantastic experience and um you know i had i had uh, that first one was great i had a lot of um stuff to do with uh in the starfleet test and um i was will was there a great guy and uh there were two other actors that i knew were there in the same room with me and uh you know we were just the guest cast but treated great and uh and i was more than surprised when, you know, I don't know, a season or two later, I got called to come and play the, the Benzite again. Mm -hmm. And I've said this before to other interviews, but I'll say it again. I was just so thrilled. I thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. I could mm -hmm. possibly come back again and again. Mm -hmm. And so I go and I play this other guy, which was way more fun because I got to, you know, bug everybody on the bridge. You know, he yeah. was the the. uh the guy that was just in everybody's kitchen telling them how to do it, how they were doing it wrong. And I got to wear the star fleet girdle. They give you a girdle to wear. So you feel really <laughs> slim under those clothes. I had the, tr the, the badge, the little, uh, transponder, uh, yeah. emblem, you know, yeah. the com badge. I had that. I was like taking pictures. It was fantastic. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, it was that one was more fun, but I was just under the impression that I was asked back because I was so good the first time. And and what I realized later as being a filmmaker and knowing, you know, how things mm -hmm. work, what do they of course they called me? They had a blue head made for me. <laughs> so why why on earth would they would they get somebody else when they've got the you know the nine hour job up on the wall there? They just call me and put it back on me, and that's what they did. Yeah. And you, you know I don't fault them for it. I would do the same exact thing today. But at the time when you're an actor and all you're thinking about is oh they like me, they like me. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I was with that. But it's yeah. really funny that I wasn't aware of that. Today, yeah. it would be just so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And thank you for telling the story. I want to follow up on a couple things. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like you said, that you were a fan of the original series and that um, that you loved it so much. Um I just find it interesting that um, on my podcast here, I've got to interview a number of people who um, uh, James L. Uh, Conway, who's a, a director who's directed a lot of Star Trek, um, David Winning, who's directed a lot of television, and Doug Leffler, who uh, does a lot of previs, and and um, uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf, uh, who is a, a producer on Deep Space Nine. So I've got to interview a lot of people, which is amazing. They all tell me. They were Star Trek fans of the original series. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, also Ethley Ann Vare, who was a television writer. She was a fan. Everybody says they were a fan. And I'm just like, I'm just always fascinated to, to hear. It was just like how influential that show actually was. And it actually spurred people on to want to make movies and make TV shows. I, I just find it amazing. Uh, I know it. The reach, the reach is amazing. I, 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 I agree. And, uh, I don't know. You know, there's a certain brand of people that it's the same with the three stooges. There's a group of people that love the three stooges. And then there's the people that don't. And usually the girls don't like the three stooges, but in the case of star Trek, you know, it's pretty universal at the time, you know, if you're mm -hmm. for a certain age group. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, the younger people had star Wars younger than mm -hmm. us, I guess. And, uh, but yeah, you don't, I don't, I don't run into too many, people in my life that don't know about it or weren't kind of interested in it or watched it to mm -hmm. one of the franchises. Yeah. And I'm watching, Oh, speaking of the franchises, this, the new one, the strange new worlds mm -hmm. is really good. I'm like way into that show, you know, the okay. prequel to captain yeah. Kirk. Yeah. You captain know, Pike. Kirk, yep. yeah. With captain Pike and stuff. Love that guy. And uh, I'm loving that show. That reminds me of the original really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Each, each week it's a different, you know, Mm -hmm. completely different adventure standalone. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's neat. And then um, another thing that I'm always curious about, um, obviously, because like I mentioned, you know, I had studied film and screenwriting when, when they're like, you're getting ready to play the Benzite Mordock or Menden. Do they tell you, does like the director tell you like how to play Mordock or do they tell you what a Benzite is or do they just like go here? No, they, lines. they tell you uh, when you go in and read, they describe the character. They give you a piece of paper with your script mm -hmm. and stuff and you read a little character description. You know, you know, it's mm -hmm. from a water planet. He's got the tendrils. He's, you know, whatever. Um, I don't remember if they if it had anything about the type of character it was. But but no, I I went in with the the uh officious uh quirky part spock part uh part uh you know uh a hummingbird you know with its it just i don't know and i did i kind of went semi british i just tried my my um uh my speech i just made it perf mm -hmm. just really clear and succinct like i learned in you know acting school speak with distinction and and i don't know it was just something that i i went with when i went in and i don't know if that's what got me the job but that's mm -hmm. what it and you know may have may have gotten me the job my take on it but i don't know when you play an alien and that you know there's 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 like a standard in which it's it's an <laughs> unspoken something you know and mm -hmm. we see it now today even you know there's it, it oh i know there was a little c3po in in me and there was a you know and there mm -hmm. was there was a uh, a bit of the officious guy and you know so yeah. you just try something and hope it's makes sense and then of course when you get all that shit on you know the makeup and stuff 
you're really gone. You're, you're so basically all you have is your, your, your movements and mm -hmm. your, your, your head movements and your posture and your voice really. Mm -hmm. And, and the uh, rate of articulation that you choose. So mm -hmm. um, other than that, no, nobody, nobody said, Hey, he's, you know, Hey, you know, make his voice deeper. Cause in Benzite, there's a, you know, no, no one did any of that. You know, it was like, I came in with whatever, they must have liked it, and uh, that's what we went with. But um, yeah. what was really hard was all the jargon, especially in uh, Matter of Honor, because all I had was jargon. I had just speeches three inches long of just jargon, and mm -hmm. it didn't, you know, it was all that stuff that you can't really understand because you don't learn it. I mean, you have to learn it, and you don't know what you're saying because you don't have any reference to this stuff that's made up. So mm -hmm. I found it, you know, really more difficult with the jargon paragraphs but um yeah. highlight though was being reprimanded by picard in his quarters <laughs> i mean that was the highlight you know being yelled at by him mm -hmm. yeah for me and that guy was great patrick stewart he that guy was a sweetheart and he was just all excited because he had just gotten the apple computer you know campaign you know for oh. the commercials mm -hmm. and uh, he was all talking about that and just that that whole uh that whole show was just really uh, professional. I mean, mm -hmm. and all the actors were, I mean, it was ensemble minded. And the fact you had a great British actor at the, at the helm made sure that nobody was, you know, a douchebag mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. everybody was, was terrific. Terrific. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was a positive experience. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I, cause I was going to follow up too. You mentioned it a little bit. Um, uh, the voice you did was perfect uh, oh, for good. it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I like the character so much is the way he spoke and the way mm -hmm. you had kind of changed your voice. Mm -hmm. um, but also I was going to ask you mentioned, like I said, you mentioned it a little bit because like when they take away like your facial expressions with this huge prosthetic, like you were saying, like you're just left with like the way you move your mm -hmm. torso and the way you move your head uh, just slightly. But I mean, you have this whole thing. So um, I, th I thought that was really, you know, really excellent the way you did uh, that portrayal, because it seems like, you know, uh, just taking away your, your whole range of facial expressions, you have to figure out something else. Right. Well, yeah. If you think about it, my my makeup took away my eyebrows. Yeah. You, you you so I any eyebrow action which signals so much to uh, people mm -hmm. is gone. So yeah. now what's left is you know a head cock. Uh, even when you like flare your eyes, it doesn't do anything. And I'm left with my lips. Mm -hmm. So my lips are uncovered. So like that is a communication. You know with you know, not speaking necessarily, but the way it's positioned, you know, can say a lot. And then, like I said, your your posture. So literally, most of it was taken away, and that's what that's when you you know when you when you have a when the character like has a question mark or doesn't understand something. Usually, the eyebrows go up, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, I don't have any because they're under a piece of foam so there's no <laughs> there's no movement yeah. so you have to like you know you now resort to like uh you know like a head cock up so if you can't move your eyebrows up what do you do your head lifts up a little bit and hopefully that'll communicate it uh or you do something with your lips and uh you know i didn't i didn't work on that it just that's what you just all you had so i think mm -hmm. my theater experience helped me when by doing that because it was you know not a real human and not a real person so i could i could literally go more theatrical with my body but you know movements mm -hmm. and stuff yeah no that's uh, i i find that fascinating because it, it mm -hmm. would definitely have to be a challenge you know because we're just so used to you know like you said using just little cues to let people know that we're asking questions or confused about something but you have to do it in another way it's just really fascinating to me yeah, the uh, the the but the other hard part was uh, aside from all that stuff and learning the jargon, the guy they kept the prop guy kept coming up to me and going, "Hey," or the camera guy would say, "Hey, can you blow into that <laughs> tray under your under your mouth under your nose so we can get some puffs of dry ice off of there?" And I'm going, but mm -hmm. I can't. I, how am I going to say the line? I said I can do it in between <laughs> lines or something or reactions. I can puff, but then I have to like literally not let on that I'm puffing, you know, and I'm yeah. going, 
So I that I had that I tried my best to please everybody by puffing in between to, you know, because that little thing, if people didn't realize it or know from the internet, it was like this little uh, curved tray on a stock that came up from my chest plate, which mm-hmm. also bounced around and was not, you know, it was improved on in the next second episode, but mm-hmm. it had uh, it was a, a little tiny tray that was hidden to camera. I had to keep my head back. So you wouldn't tip down and see that inside the prop man had dropped little dry ice crystals Mm -hmm. or little ice pieces into the tray. Mm -hmm. And my blowing on it would make a puff of smoke. And they figured out that's the easiest thing to do rather than put some kind of burning element in there or some smoke, something that's, you know, burning. So uh, I had to worry about that. And I also had to worry about not tipping my head too forward because the camera would see it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and then the cameraman going, that looks really good. If you puff, try to hold your head this way because the lights catch it. I'm going, okay, guys. I, you know, you want me to say the line, <laughs> right? I might not be able to get there. You know, <laughs> that was the uh, technical part. But you know what? I'm a, I'm that's, I'm a technical kind of actor. I came up in short form summer stock where you have to like learn a show in one week, blocking and all, and uh, so that helped me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it it was uh, it was a fun acting experience. I was very young, so it was all fun for me. Yeah, you know, all fun. Yeah, and um, just that little motion there with you, like puffing into the the dry ice, kind of became like almost like he was thinking. You know, it kind of became like a mm. kind of a punctuation mark, like you know, after Picard says something to him or something, or he says something he you know, he would kind of blow into the thing like he was thinking or he's thinking about something. And I think it added to the character uh, quite a bit. Um, so uh, sorry, it was so difficult for you, but it, it made the it made the visual experience great because it, it was really, fine. Really good. It was <laughs> fine. You know, a couple of years back, there was a guy contacted me on the Internet who made he literally made a replica of that oh, nice. chess piece. That mm-hmm. went on the Mordock or Menda, you know, their their the outfit with the little mm-hmm. rod that comes up, and he's literally was sending me photos of. It. He goes, "I'm," he's you know, a Trek fan. Yeah. He's going, "Hey, I'm making this. Can you talk? Tell me about how it was." I I got on the phone with him and I explained exactly how it went, and he made a complete replica of it, mm-hmm. and uh, it looked exactly like the mm-hmm. one that I was wearing. And wow. I went, "Oh my God, somebody's doing this. Yeah, it's amazing." Yeah, Trek fans. Um, are the best fans, but they're also crazy. But <laughs> they they do some crazy stuff. They go to great uh, extremes. Yes, they do. But um, as as a proud Trek fan sitting over here, so I have no, I I cannot uh, talk because I did some crazy stuff too with Star Trek. But, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, whenever I uh, the last couple times I got to play a role playing game that was Star Trek, I have played a Benzite. Uh, because mm, nice, I know because I. Uh, I just, I just found the, the characters to be great. And, um, and you're not in any danger, but if Paramount put me in charge of making, uh, the Enterprise <laughs> G show or whatever it is, Captain Mordock, I would want nice. Captain Mordock to be there. Um, nice. so I'd give you a call, but then you would say you would freak out because you don't want to put the makeup on anymore. But no, we could maybe the, the head pieces are improved by then. And I could be like Andy Circus and just wear a green helmet or something. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You could wear a green helmet or something. And, yeah, but, yeah uh, just but yeah you're n- you're not in any danger uh paramount hasn't been uh hasn't been hitting me up right. recently so <laughs> no right. danger of that <laughs> well i do it for you i do it a couple times until we figure out a way out of it for me oh there you as go. long as i could direct some of them that's all oh well yeah absolutely yeah whatever you want if you're in the show I'll, i noticed I'll give you, you pick you pick mordock over mendon because mendon was kind of like a a, a, a nudge Whereas uh, yep. Mordok probably was a little wiser because he, you know, won the Starfleet, you know, contest or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mordok was, he got into Starfleet. He so got into the, Starfleet. Yeah, yeah, he'd be the first one. He'd in probably there, be so. smarter as a, as a captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> than, and than then the other guy. But then, you know, you could play him like, you know, a more mature version. But like mm-hmm. I said, you're not in any danger. And okay, uh, this is all, this is all nice. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, I'll let you direct every episode if you're in like, yeah, if you're in like the first season and then we could kill you off in some cool way if you wanted to drop nice. out or something like that yeah, i'm in be awesome all I'm right in. so yeah once uh paramount uh hits me up i'll, I'll let you know <laughs> Excellent. but anyway um you uh then 
kind of transitioned out of acting as we kind of alluded to before <laughs> and you had started directing and so you kind of started mentioning it but you kind of began um professionally i guess with episodic television isn't that right um no, no actually well let's see let's see no no uh no um in 1994 uh, i was playing basketball with um a movie producer guy and a bunch of guys i know he used to be an actor and um mm -hmm. his name is andrew stevens you might recall and uh he uh he was making films uh direct to video films low budget films for roger corman he had corman had hired him to make like a slew of movies mm -hmm. and uh i had done three short films and by the third one i was finally got it right and i was pimping that around so one day i you know my friend introduced us larry poindexter introduced us and he said hey john this is andrew andrew makes movies john's a director and uh, i said you do you make movies i said well i i could i'm a director i said can can i you know submit so i gave him one of my gave him the short film and you know he called me i don't even think he watched the whole thing he just called me and and said can you make this kids movie in 12 days and i go yeah <laughs> so uh my first movie was a a home alone ripoff direct to video for roger corman through andrew's company and it was called alone in the woods and it was like uh like i said it was a, a home alone ripoff mm -hmm. and i had kids i had stunts i had bad guys it was really fun and we had 12 days to shoot it uh, on film in uh out in here in california and uh, so i did that and um and he kept calling me to to do other other films and so i did a, a few you know through the 90s i did some b movie action films and a couple more kids movies and during that time uh one of my crew members also worked at saban uh entertainment where they make power rangers and uh beetleborgs and night not night rider there was a b something rider uh mass rider and you know all these shoot off shows and um she recommended me to uh to her boss and the, uh, for this show called the big bad beetleborgs and so i got that job based on my slapstick kid movie that i made for andrew so in like mm -hmm from 95 to 97 or 98 i was working at saban and doing b movies for andrew and um direct video movies you know b is not a bad uh, mm -hmm. term to me <clears throat> it just means they're not a studio film yeah so so that's that's and, and so i had done low band kids tv for you know fox network or whatever yeah channel carried the you know the power rangers and yeah. uh and then um you know i i, I decided i'm going to try to you know i was trying all along to get into television because i knew that's where i needed to be and um you know i got a shot um uh, of my father's friend from college his son was a tv executive for the carsey werner company and uh i was in touch with him and uh and you know i filled him in on what i did and i you know i made a reel i i had trailers you know i had you know i i knew how to position myself to uh you know someone in a position to hire and uh he gave me a shot on a show called uh grounded for life which was on fox and it was donal logue and uh kevin corrigan and uh it was like a half it was a half hour single camera comedy and it was very much malcolm in the middle ish mm -hmm. and uh so i got a shot on that show and uh never seen the money like money like that being spent on it it was amazing i was like looking around going are we guess this is all for us we can use these cranes and these steady cams are you kidding me so um i worked on that show and i you know as long as you don't screw it up they'll ask you back and that's how i got into tv and then from there you just you know you just do a good job and you're in the you're in the, you're, you make the list and you're apparently you're approved so and it just kept going from there and then my you know i snowballed into bigger things scrubs mm -hmm. and cougar town and you know ugly betty and all the other shows i ended up doing mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so. abs- yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's amazing. Um, uh, you know, just thinking about some of that. So, um, uh, just wondering the transition from making what you call the B movies to like the Fox show, right. Uh, was a huge one because I would imagine, because you had to make the, the one a, a lot cheaper and a lot quicker than, than you were making the, the like grounded for life or something like that. Yeah. My listen, the, the, the low budget Corman style training and then the kid show, mm-hmm. which was even cheaper, uh, was just an, an amazing, uh, learning ground, to, you mm-hmm. know, to be efficient mm-hmm. and to not waste and to not, and to always be prepared. And, uh, I, I guess it worked for me because again, coming from summer stock where you have like a week and a half to put a show up, you know, mm-hmm. if we full, fully dressed and fully memorized and fully produced, uh, just somehow, you know, that, uh, time frame limit, it just worked for low budget and uh and i'm grateful because i'm glad i started out low budget and cheap because it only it so prepares you for when you get to the big show and there's nothing but money and time wasted and too many people and everything slows down to a crawl it it just really even though it 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 makes you more it it helps move things along if you uh, are prepared and know what you want to do. And, and I do remember, uh, Roger Corman used to give out this one sheet of paper with his instructions to directors on what to do <laughs> to, to direct. And it was like literally one piece of paper and it had like maybe seven or eight things on it to mm-hmm. do. And it explained when you've selected your shot, when you've t- gotten your master and your close up. Always say thank you out loud and say, now we're going to move on to this seat, you know, or <laughs> now we're going to do a shot over here. He said, always announce out loud before anybody can stop you was his, was his <laughs> advice. Always, always know where you're going to go next, even during while you're doing the shot mm-hmm. you're on. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that. And it's true. I still, to this day, sit behind the monitor, no matter what the budget with the cameraman. And while the actor's doing their scene or something, and I, I literally like, I'll le- lean over to the cameraman. I'll say, all right, I say we do the two shot next. So we'll move over to that. And he's going, yeah, we'll do that next. And then we'll do this after that and that after that. And then before you know it, you know, it's so literally the shot ends. Thank you. Now let's go over and do this. Everyone like on the set, there's no stopping. Mm -hmm. Everyone turns. Okay. Cameras roll over there and you know, you're getting set. It's not like there's like this downtime. Like I've been an actor on shows where, you know, you finish a, a shot or a scene and there's like 10 minutes of nothing where there's just like murmuring and people chatting and not knowing which. And then finally somebody says, all right, we're getting a shot over here. So I'm, I can't, can't deal with it that way. So it has helped me uh, immensely, even at, even when you get to a level where you're just sitting around waiting for, for the machine to like get into place, which is, you know, television or movies. Yeah. It's uh, it's always uh, it's made things go faster. Yeah. Well, maybe some, more prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I can attest from, uh, like I said, <laughs> my laughable, own laughable experience is trying to be a filmmaker. If you don't know what you're doing, um, nobody else does, certainly. <laughs> uh, they yeah, will, they will be happy to sit there and talk and wait for you. But if you don't know what you're doing, um, you. I you, know. And yeah, I wish yeah. I had that piece of paper still. I'd never kept it. Yeah. it, it I would love to read the other stuff. That, you mm-hmm. know, I, I try to remember the things he said on it, but uh, that yeah. was the, the main thing. He, he would he, he would say always, you know, set your geography with your shot, you know, of the room with a panning shot or some sort of wide angle, mm-hmm. then start covering it. You know, it was like simple ABC yeah. stuff, but yeah. you know, but the yeah. thing about like announcing where you're going next, right after you say cut, always yeah. say thank you. And then say, exactly. now we're moving on. And, you know, in Roger's voice, he always talked like this. It could, when you read <laughs> it, you're just thinking about Roger's voice. I had one experience with Roger Corman where I had to okay. show him the kids movie. After yeah. you make the film, you got to go over to his office in Brentwood and put it on the 
three quarter inch mm -hmm. tape deck and you sit in this tiny old projection booth that used to be a projection room for him back in the mm -hmm. day and yeah. now now it became just like a screening room there was a television set <laughs> and a and a and a three quarter inch tape and then you you mm -hmm. put it in and you'd sit there and you'd have to watch it with him mm -hmm. and he had a pad and he would take notes but oh. the temperature was so warm in there that it like made him drowsy so most of the movie he was asleep <laughs> And then, but when it was over, when it was over and I sat next to him, when it was over, he, he'd say, well, that was very nice. Let's uh, go into the, uh, let's go into my office and discuss it. And we get up and we go into his office and I'm thinking, what's he going to say? He was sleeping. He hated it. And instead he goes, I think the titles were really great in this film. And I'm going, what's with the titles? <laughs> like the titles. And he goes, and uh, I think we're uh, we're in a good place. Uh, I think you might want to remove two frames uh, from the shot of the little boy right before he's about to come out from behind the tree. And we're me and the editor are looking at each other like, he wants two frames. We got to <laughs> go look at that. So uh, so we're like, we we literally, thank you, Roger. And he says, now I'd like to talk about another film. And they started attacking Andrew for some other movie that wasn't you know, quite ready or something. So we were <laughs> off the hook. So we go back to the edit machine. It, back then, it was a D-Vision. It was the old, one of the oldest editing systems ever, nonlinear. Mm. It was one of the first. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was uh, PC-based, and you, there was no mouse or anything. It was all keyboard. Anyway, he, we go to that scene that he talked about, and uh, and we pulled it up, and like the editor goes puts the time puts the crosshair right on the thing that he was talking about and he did the you know the the arrow yeah. key right and left and god damn if he wasn't right there were two <laughs> extra frames on the edit <laughs> and we were like going, oh, my God, Roger Corman just gave us a note like legend, you know, a legend note. Yeah. It was amazing. And we cut the two frames off and he was right. It looked like it looked like the kid moved a little uh -huh. and it was just a bad edit. But he mm -hmm. saw it out of all that stuff. And then the rest of the time he was asleep. <laughs> So, <laughs> oh my gosh, that is incredible. And if, well, if anybody's listening and they're, uh, they don't know some of, about film history, ro some amazing filmmakers have come out of, uh, Roger Corman's, uh, mm -hmm. uh we'll put it in qu air quotes, film school, right? He right. ran a lot of people through the ringer, including Blagdanovich, Scorsese, Jack Nicholson. Um, I mean, the list could go on and on. I'm sure, uh, just so many people have come out of that. James Cameron, I believe came out of doing some of his low budget stuff as well so um uh amazing uh roger corman film school i would have uh i would uh i would probably murder people to have been involved in some of that <laughs> but, I, uh, yeah it, it was it's still around i mean the uh wow. trap uh, the uh, residue is still out here i know a lot of yeah. people who got to work with him and made movies with him and and we all have this everyone has the same funny story you know yeah. Yeah. some some great great story yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and and now just, uh, you know, I'm just thinking because a lot of people have watched a lot of television kind of move into some of the episodic television that you were talking about. You know, everybody's consumed tons and tons of television, but obviously the majority of people who are listening have no idea in some cases how it's even made. And so mm -hmm. um, if you could kind of walk us through the process just a little bit of, you know, a director, like if a show calls you or whatever, how does that process start? Do you get a script before you're on set or how, mm -hmm. how does some of those things work and, and how do you build up to, you know, before you start rolling the camera and all that? Well, uh, television episodic, either half hour or hour is sort of, sort of similar. The only diff, the, the difference is the, uh, amount of days that are shot and the amount of pages the script are. Okay. Uh, the sitcom, which is the one in front of a live audience is a completely different animal. And I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but I'll tell you, um, the episodic television is pretty much the same. There's a, a slew of episodes that are ordered, uh, and scripts start getting written. And by a group of writers in a room and uh, and then, you know, production dates are set and it's usually for an hour show. It's 10 days of shooting. They used to like to do it in eight, but nobody can anymore. So they've made it 10. And for a half hour show, uh, which is usually 20 minutes uh, with without commercials, it's usually like a five day shoot. So when you see a half hour a comedy like Scrubs or or Cougar Town or those types of shows or uh, the Goldbergs that's one that's still on I think 
uh, that's like a five day shoot. But if you see like an hour show, you know, like a, any of the cop shows or doctor shows or anything, those are like, uh, those are eight to 10 days. And, um, usually um some of the the directors are assigned episodes usually before the season starts they start booking um directors um ahead of time and they you know fill the calendar based on the uh their schedule and uh in the old days uh you used to be able to do like two or three a season and there was coherency in the uh, or cohesiveness with the directors. Uh, nowadays, uh, in the last I don't know five five to ten years, the they literally change them out every episode. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, your cast doesn't have any the same director every week, which I don't I don't think is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, mainly, I think it's done now because. Uh, just the industry's changed and the right the writers uh do not like to uh give the directors you know, any kind of uh power really i don't know if that's the right word but they would prefer not to have their cast or their show have any allegiance to you know a director who's just come in you know for for a week or two uh usually it's you know someone who's also producing at the same time so having said that there's like a different guy or gal every week uh uh, and uh you get while you're prepping your show they're shooting the show prior to yours Mm -hmm. so while i'm in the office and going on location scouts with my first assistant director and you know the the uh the the department heads that are there all the time i'm doing that prepping what's going to shoot in about a week the camera operator the the deep the director of photography and the and the shooting crew and the director that's ahead of me is is shooting at the same time Mm -hmm. so while they're shooting i'm prepping and then when they finish their episode the weekend hits then you come back monday and i'm shooting and a new director that comes behind me is now prepping so it's sort of you 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 literally just leapfrog with somebody Mm -hmm. so if you do do more than one episode you're never doing two in a row um, you're always, you know, one off, one on, you know, so you can properly prepare, prep the the next episode. And um, in a half hour sitcom with a live audience, the kind that have four cameras and are shot like Friends was shot, like uh, I guess the Connors is still on the air. That show uh, mm-hmm. is current. That's a sitcom that's shot in front of a lot. You know, like I love Lucy style. Yeah. The and one day at a time was like that on the family. All those that's four cameras on a box set. And it's literally you rehearse all week and maybe shoot maybe some bumpers or little little scenes that can't be done in front of a live audience. And then on Friday, you invite an audience in, you do a dress rehearsal, you shoot it, and then you do a, another pass at it. And uh, you do it twice in front of a live audience, and it really doesn't stop. You just really don't stop unless there's a huge mistake and you have to go back and do something. And they do that to capture the performance and the and the laugh track of the audience. That's a really easy schedule. It's like a Monday through Friday, and you you really only shoot on on the final day. That's how Seinfeld did it. Yeah, and that's how you know all those half hours with you know in front of live audiences. So there's really no there's no fourth wall. You don't turn the cameras around you basically just shoot actors in a box set like a play yeah and uh it's it's a wildly different format and a completely different style of directing that requires really no filmmaking experience you you really are not called upon to tell a story using the camera it's really basically just a play Mm -hmm. and you're relying on the the playwright and the, the script and the actors so there's really no cinema uh i've done them i don't particularly enjoy them and i used to act in them mm-hmm. which was more fun than directing them okay so that's kind of how it how it works did that kind of answer your question yeah absolutely okay. no absolutely I, I, and thank you for explaining that because i think sometimes mm-hmm. yeah it gets a little confusing and and i think definitely the difference between like a live studio audience shoot um as opposed to one that is 
more cinematic, you might say, of course, because you can turn the camera wherever the set goes, right? You can turn it mm -hmm. around and upside down and put it on the floor and do different things mm -hmm. like that. Whereas those sitcom shows, I think everybody's familiar with, it's the it's always the same shot in so and so's mm -hmm. living room, right? It's mm -hmm. always the same shot. It's always the same close up. It's always the same thing because you know that's where the camera is, and that's where the if you move the camera. In the wide shot, you're going to see you're going to see lights and the set and you know and and mm -hmm. things like that. So I think that's that's really good, um, a really good explanation there. But um, um, and so I appreciate that. But also, you know, in addition to your your film, you know, to your television work and some of your early film work, you've you've really started some, I guess maybe I call them passion project projects or something that you've really started um, directing your own independent film. So why don't you tell us a, a little about a couple of those, and then maybe I'll have some questions for you know how you approach filmmaking in the in those. Sure. I um um coming from the theater and with great respect for the director and uh, being a film fan you know and my father was a director I you know I had the how what I learned a director was is that's the person who's the author of the of the film you know the 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 voice the 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 idea the the visualization the author of the of the movie as you see it you know like the great filmmakers have done and uh when i got into television um and that's how i made films growing up you know whether they be super eight or or uh 16 or whatever and you know you hear about sundance film festival you see filmmakers you know delivering beautiful movies with style that's their point of view well in television your the director's point of view is really not this it's not the same as in a movie mm -hmm. so uh once i got to television and i was basically prevented from uh from having my point of view you know inserted into the material because you basically have to follow a template that the show has already established um, I was, uh, taken aback by that and was like, I didn't, it didn't, it, it, it was, it was tough for me because I learned, I learned it differently. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when you're, uh, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to sound negative about it, but when you are a director in television, you really do not have final cut of what you're, when you turn it in, you know, mm -hmm. it is recut and changed and made to, the desires and wishes of usually the the producer or the head head writer or whoever has the most you know whoever's in charge really mm -hmm. and that's a common practice and that's a that's a big problem and war between the writers guild and the directors guild and always has been over the years just in television so um i uh i had an experience at a tv movie house that i was working at where that that occurred to such a degree that i was just like I, 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 I almost had a meltdown about it and I decided I can't, I'll never be able to get what I want, uh, here in the, in television land. So I might as well just start making my own movies again. And that's when I decided to, uh, take, take the money I've earned and use it for good instead of evil <laughs> and, uh, make, make some independent movies again. And then, and that was just when HD consumer HD cameras were just, coming in to play mm -hmm. in the mid 2000s and uh, so i found a friend i wrote a script with i called all my actor friends that i'd worked with on the big stuff some big names some small you know good actors and and non names and we i bought we bought me and my camera guy bought two hd cameras and we uh said okay let's go make a you know a fifty thousand dollar movie and that's what we did and it was called mojave phone booth and uh, that was 2005. And it was just such a rewarding experience because it reminded me of like how it used to be. You know, I, you write, you direct, you edit, the, you, you decide where the music goes, you work with the composer, you know, everything. You make the poster yourself, you know, all the stuff, you know, the stuff you do when you're a filmmaker and an artist. So that went so well that I decided I might have to do this again. So this is what helped me get through all the years of directing episodic television was knowing full well that I could use the, I could use the earnings, you know, I'd save, I'd have a little savings account and I would try to like put money away, you know, whenever I could and uh, continue to make these movies. And they're all at 
professional level, polished, complete features. Many have won festivals and played in festivals. And then, but so I just kept going. And uh, in in about 10 years, I made like five movies, uh, which really kept me, uh, kept the sanity for, you know, someone who wants to be a filmmaker. And uh, it really helped me get through the, how television works. It kept me from being angry about it or being, you know, un, unhappy with it. it. It allowed me to, to really embrace it and, and, and find the positive in it. And it was to basically just finance my movies. And so after Mojave phone booth, I made a movie called route 30 and I shot it my own hometown in Pennsylvania. And I used a lot of actors from that theater that, that I worked at when I was a kid, my dad's theater. And, uh, and I finished it and I brought it back to the hometown. And even though I tried to get it distributed through the proper channels in, you know, in the world of film out here, uh, it, the, the most satisfying aspect of it was, was when I took it home and I, I rented the local movie theater in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and I promoted it and I sold tickets and it paid for the rental and then some, and I showed the movie to the town that we shot it in and it was full and everybody came out. It was two screenings. It was a weekend and we couldn't believe it and they loved it. And we had a Q and a, and then all of a sudden I went, okay, this is fun this these people appreciate it and nobody else has ever heard of this movie so and that's and then i made two more and, and i called it a trilogy and i kept going back and doing the same exact thing put it in festivals show it where i can knowing full well i would not make money back and uh then just started putting it up online to you know and uh distributing it myself and then uh culminating in the last one called the father and the bear which was a drama, which was set at this theater that I grew up at. And I used the entire location and starred, you know, placed the movie there because it's just such an unusual place. You don't see many movies shot in a summer stock theater. <laughs> yeah. And it's just not, it's just not something people see. So it seemed original to do something there. And, and I did that film and it, to, to great success. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like I've tapered off a bit since then because, you know, the television, the revenue stream to support my habit of making, you know, independent movies is sort of like gotten smaller lately. So I'm being very careful about what I'm planning next. But uh, I got to say, you know, I, I got to say it's a some people who want to make their movie or their script spend 10 years trying to get it made. And uh, because they're so concerned with getting, you know, Brad Pitt in it or somebody, somebody they can't possibly ever get or some actor here, you know, and they'll spend forever submitting it and trying to get it made. And like, I've made like five movies in the same 10 years. A friend of mine is still trying to get his script made. I said, why don't you, throw a credit card down and make it don't you want to see it and but some people can't you know they have to have it it must air on television for them or it must be in a movie theater or it has to be picked up by netflix and i've lived all that those dreams and found that you know usually it's the, the percentage of that happening is so slim that you might as well just do it for the sake of the art or the happiness or whatever mm -hmm. so so that's how uh, that's how I got through the last, I guess, fifteen years uh, working here in in the in the business was being able to make those those movies, yeah, which I love and I'm glad I made. Yeah, no, that's it's it's, it's amazing uh, hearing you talk about that, and I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more um, uh, about you know making your own movies. I just yeah, uh, somebody a while back sent me an email and said they had been trying to get their movie off the ground for twenty years, and oh my and, god, you know, I know, and it was just like. I, I don't know. I was just like, oh my, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, that's like a, a huge portion of your life. Right? Think of how many um, movies this person could have written in twenty years. I oh, mean, you I could, you could, you could that, that's the thing about it. Some, it's, it's really, 
I try to explain this to uh, people. I say, just keep keep writing them and and don't write something you can't make in your backyard. Yeah. Write something that you could literally pull together yourself. You know, don't mm-hmm. write a movie about people on Mars or the moon. You'll never, you'll never, you know, you, yeah. you'll have to wait 10 years till somebody decides to want to make it. You, you write something that takes place in that cornfield out there, you know, mm-hmm. and then you could literally make it. So yeah. that's my motto on the subject. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, yes. You use what you have instead of, uh-huh. uh, instead of, yeah. uh, you know, having the opening shot pass by a huge mansion with like three Ferraris in the, in the driveway yeah, or something like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I used yeah, to do this, uh, um, anti Hollywood movie seminar when I was into sharing this, uh, this feeling. Uh, and a lot of it was, you know, the whole thing was like, here, utilize your resources, you know, don't write a script and then figure out how to make it look around at your, what you've got at your disposal and then come up with a story around it. You know, if your uncle uh, owns the Ford dealership in town, guess where your movie's going to take place? You know, (laughs) that's production value. So, you know, I try to, I used to spend a lot of time uh, extolling those tips. uh, And then I just got tired of, you know, doing it because most people just wanted to hear about actors. You know, they literally, I mean, you could, you could, you can create a seminar for actors because, you know, you'll, you'll fill it. But if you do a seminar for filmmakers, you know, they don't want to hear somebody else's method because they know better. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's what I found out. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I did when I was younger. I don't anymore. <laughs> I uh-huh. don't anymore, but, um, and I'll also back up the small town America. If you are making a movie in a small town, people go nuts and you can have access they to love coffee it. shops, flower yeah. shops. You can run yeah. the whole town. You can, uh, you can have, you know, you can have fake guns out. The police yeah. will be there. Everybody's happy. Everybody's like, Oh my gosh, it's a movie. Everybody yeah, loves as, it. As long as you're nice to people and you're not a poser, yeah. And you're you're a you're an open book. Why wouldn't yeah. some, people are friendly and want to help you? Not yeah. in the big city, though. No, no way. No, but a small town, uh, you got the run of the place. If you're making yeah. a movie, people people yeah. lose their people want to help you. Yeah, if absolutely. you know, if you ask for help, they will give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. The beauty of it. No, absolutely. It only works in a in in a, in regions where there's not film happening yeah. that's the only place it'll work yeah no no absolutely yeah yeah and you don't need permits you don't need anything like that um we ran up and down streets and had mm-hmm. you know fake firearms and stuff and people <laughs> you know police would come by and talk with us and stuff and we're just everybody's cool everybody's fine nobody cares um mm-hmm. it's just awesome so yeah <laughs> it's just uh some really neat stuff out there i, I do have a couple extra questions i know we yeah. the time is getting away from us here but i do have a few other Please. questions i wanted to uh, um just to ask um one of the well i was going to say one of the problems i had when i was trying my own filmmaking i had many problems when i was trying my own filmmaking um one of the big ones of course was is you know i i studied screenwriting in college and i did some things and then the first time i have actors i have real actors and i'm all excited i realized i had no idea what to tell them i have this really <laughs> interesting idea in my head and i'm just like make that happen and nobody understands what i'm doing so what do you what do you do as a director when you talk to actors to tell them different things of course you know i've read the hollywood books and stuff Mm -hmm. that you know where people are like slapping actresses and things I, i don't get any of that stuff but um what do you tell you know actors as you know to try to get that performance that you're looking for well, I think it all starts with the script and the interpretation of it. So if if you're a, a smart person, you'll talk with that actor or actress prior to showing up on the set and discuss it with them and say, hey, is it clear, this script? Does it make sense mm-hmm. to you, the, you know, these emotions that run through here? And, you know, if you're writing it, it's pretty obvious. You'll you'll put things in brackets to remind the actor, to point the audience, you know, whoever, you know, and actors love that stuff. You know, if, if, if you describe in the script the somber nature of that scene or the way the actor feels, the character feels, they're, they're, they just would basically be stupid if they didn't understand it so Mm -hmm. you have to assume that your 
textbook, which is your script, is going to impart, you know, the, the overall everything. And if it, and that's why you say, is anything not clear to you? And let, 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 let's talk about it. And you get two things occur when you do this ahead of time. You get to have a conversation with somebody and you get to know each other just like we're doing now. Mm-hmm. And you also get, um, you know, uh, you have a, a, a any weird questions are answered that so by the time you get on the set you're pretty much everybody's in the same you know boat uh so actors are pretty smart the the, the ones that are professionals and have mm-hmm. acted before you know mm-hmm. now an absolute beginner it's a different story you know you would literally you you'd have to teach them how to act but you you hopefully want to avoid that but um when it when an actor's on in a scene and they're not quite getting there or they uh or they're they're misinterpreting something you know usually i usually start by saying hey i don't i'm sorry this isn't clear in the script but that this moment you the characters probably feeling a different feeling than you're than you're you're doing right now and and they'll immediately want to know the correct way you know Mm -hmm. so you know you have to cast the right people and if you cast if you're a good person to cast if you have an eye for talent and when you have auditions you you can see obviously who knows what's going on if you cast the right person you're really not going to have much trouble when you get on set and i think the only trouble people get into is when they don't talk to someone ahead of time Mm -hmm. or they cast someone without you know, any prior, uh, d- discussions or, or a reading or anything, you, that's when you're going to be surprised. And, uh, and I don't think, you know, actors are, all they want to do is feel safe and, um, they, they don't want to be, uh, embarrassed and they don't want to be feel uh, like unsafe or, or they don't want to look stupid. Yeah. So your job as a director is to create an environment where they feel safe to make mistakes or try stuff. And so you're kind of like the biggest supporting cheerleader there is. And if you approach it that way, you're, you know, and not be so uptight about your material and somebody's interpretation there, no one's ever going to say it the way you heard it when you uh, wrote it down. And I find writers in television today have that problem. They, they're, they don't understand that there's, their point is being made, but it's not being said the same way that they would say it in the room when they wrote it or acted it out in their head or whatever. And uh, if if you're if you're looking at it from ten thousand feet and going, oh, I understand that uh, that thought that that actor said with that line. So it's not what I originally had heard, but it it absolutely worked. So I'm not going to botanically argue with that actor about where to put the comma or the period, you know, Mm -hmm. if it's still, if it makes sense. So I think it's, you just have to be confident um, and, and realize that you're the, you're the parent and you're here to make this or the host and you're here to make your guests feel comfortable. And um, as long as, you know, you don't panic, no one else will. And uh, I think that's the key. That's humanity really. Mm -hmm you know yeah. and it and it works on a set like you wouldn't believe yeah you know yeah and i have uh i have uh an idea that since you had been an actor yourself you that gives you a, kind of a leg up when you're directing actors i would imagine yeah true uh and i remember when i was an actor whenever i worked with a director that was an actor as well it somehow was it seemed simpler and more mm-hmm. comfortable and then the times were you know I, there were a few times as an actor where I worked with, you know, directors that were not uh, actors in the past or really did not have a good bedside manner and didn't really know how to talk to, to an actor. I, you know, I would, I understood immediately where they were coming from and, you know, realized I was kind of on my own and I have to like protect my own performance because I'm not going to get it from this person. Okay. So, yeah. um, yeah, you know, I guess being an actor makes me not afraid to talk to actors because I still feel like I'm part of the part of their group. But uh, and I and I often suggest that if you're going to direct, you you really should do some acting. You really should take it 
take an acting class or be in it, be in a scene and shoot it and direct it and see what it's like. Mm-hmm. It's and I also as uh, I also believe that the best directors also are editors who make their own. Mm. If you make your own movie, you really should edit it because until you edit a movie from start to finish of your own, whether it be short or, or long, you you won't understand the mechanics of getting the scene shot correctly until you sit there and you edit in front of your computer and go, oh, my God, why did I shoot this or why didn't I shoot this? Why didn't I get that shot? And in, and if you're never, ever an editor, you really don't understand that. I mean, you you really it's really helpful to be to edit your own stuff. Yeah. That's a hard one for a lot of people because they don't they don't want they're afraid of computers and software and everything. And but I find it to be the most delightful part of the process. I love editing. Love it. Nice. Yeah. I'm sure you do, too. Oh, yeah, I used to. I haven't done much <laughs> recently. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it's uh it's where really the story comes together when you make, um, I remember on, yeah, on my, the, my, I'm again, I, not, there is no equivalence between what you do and what I did in my filmmaking. But, um, when I did my last one, I just remember cutting some scenes together and, um, it just like, it did come to together just like I had kind of pictured it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, this mm-hmm. is where it comes together because before, right. You know, I'm looking at these disjointed shots and these things and people were fooling around and say, you know, and then finally in the editing is where it actually comes together and tells the story. And so, um, no, I would I think that's great advice as well um, that anybody who's out there who's wanting to try to do something. And um, two more questions really quick, if I could. Um, uh, I know yeah. one problem that I had also another problem that I also had is, you know, I got a few skills, you know, I got a few skills here in me when I went to college and I was like, all right, I'm going to shoot a movie. And I just, just needed something to shoot. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so um, I whipped up something and mm-hmm. shot it and it was garbage. And you know, I'm just like, I was just like, um, how, how do you figure, how do you realize that your idea is like can carry a feature film? Right. Because I know, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of being self-deprecating here because um, you know, it's my, it's my show and I can kind of be, and hopefully people, <laughs> and, you know, um, understand where I'm coming from, but um, you know, where, you know, how do you know the idea carries a feature film instead? So you, you're not, because I know a lot of, uh, you know, I've met a lot of aspiring filmmakers in my day, and a lot of them are shooting things that can't support a feature film or need to be completely reworked before they would support a, a feature film kind of thing. I know. And that's the problem we have today. Um, I don't know what the answer is because, mm-hmm. you know, in the old days, when I say old days, it doesn't mean that old, but yeah. you used to have to go to college to, to, to study film and learn every aspect of it. And that included and included writing it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and stru- story structure and all that stuff mm-hmm. today. It's just, anybody does anything as you know, and they're an expert. Yeah. So it's like, it's open season and you mm-hmm. apparently there's no uh, standards anymore. So, you know, half the people that are in charge and, you know, making movies nowadays are like, didn't even go, go to film school and don't even know, you know, the process of a story and, and the structure of it. So, um, I don't, the, I don't have an answer for that other than there are so many, I know there's books and stuff like I studied with Sid Field and, and John Truby, which were two, they were the two gurus at the time when I was like figuring out story structure, but you know, you can, it, it really depends on what you, what st- story it is that gets to you and you want to tell. I think you can turn any idea into like a fleshed out story. If you know, you st- logically spend the time on it but it has to mean something to you just to sit there and like go you know hey let's come up with a a horror movie where that that is different from any other horror movie and then you just try to come up with something those those are usually fails yeah. but the stuff that can sustain a whole story is usually something personal mm-hmm. or or something that's happened to you that you're an expert on and you know about and that's where i think people get into trouble when they just decide to be screenwriters i'm doing air quotes Mm -hmm. uh when they decide to be screenwriters they just like think you just make shit up out of nowhere 
and your your writing acumen will take care of the rest. But when in fact, it's I have found that if you don't pinpoint the thing that means something to you, whether it's a political thing or an emotional mm-hmm. thing or a, or, or a thing that happened in your life that's traumatized you or made you supremely happy, whatever it may be, if you don't find that, it's, it would be really hard to come up with something to build around it. In my case, uh, after I like got rid of the whole story structure, you know, rules in your head, which you're told you're just pounded in here in, in LA, you know, if you want to have a movie made, you know, here, you got to have the, 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 the villain and you got to have the, you know, the hero at a higher level. They have to clash at the end of act two. They have to, you know, all these things, there has to be an inciting incident. You have to spin the story at this point. And you're, you're so like, lost with the structure points that you can't fill in the blanks because you're sitting there going, I don't know what my inciting incident is. I don't know what my big, you know, Danum Y is or the Deus Ex Machina or whatever the <laughs> fuck they call it these days. And, you know, you just like, and, and fi- for me, it was, it was like, I had like, I had three little sketches. This I'm speaking of route 30. Now I had three little sketches that neither, none of them could sustain an entire movie. And I said, well, how can I like smash these together? And it might make one giant story. And that's when I went, Oh, well, that's an idea. Take, take three things and make them, you know, intertwine somehow. And that way you're going from one to the other, or you're jumping from one to the other all the way through and somehow find a way to make them all come together at the end or something. And that's how I, that worked for me best because I got to be honest, I couldn't come up with one idea that sustains a hundred pages. I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I did it. And I, and I continued to do it. And uh however, I didn't do that on my last screenplay, the, 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 father and the bear, which dealt with dementia and Alzheimer's because it was in my family. Um, I, that one was a departure from the three idea smashing together idea. And I had to come up with a whole, whole story. Mm-hmm. So in that case, I, but at least I had a progression of something. Mm-hmm. So I, but yeah, there, I'm sorry to go on long, but I don't no, know the answer to that. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it is, I understand what you mean when you ask it, because mm-hmm. it, really is uh, a mystery and a problem at the same time for, you know, I mean, for most people yeah, trying Um, to do it. Yeah, no, no, I I agree. And, and I think your point there about having some kind of idea, whether it's a political thing, a social thing, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever, some kind of idea, because I mean, I know my, my best movie was my well, the last one I made because I wanted to say something, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I had a, a unique experience and I wanted to talk about that. Yeah. And, and you want to get it off your chest exactly. or, 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 uh, dramatize, you know, yeah. something with a, with an opinion, uh, yes. uh tacked on. And that's, yeah. that's usually the best, easiest yeah. stuff that write, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it almost wrote itself, right. It almost wrote yes. itself. And I was yes. still, you know, just my, I think just my inexperience still kind of showed through, but it was the easiest one to ever make, (laughs) you know, because I wasn't just fighting for something, just thinking like, well, I have a camera, I have a sound guy and I have, you know, a few friends who are actors. Let's make a movie. Well, what's, what's the movie about? And that's usually a disaster (laughs) that, um, you know, because, you know, what do you shoot then? What are you, what are you doing? Um, Yeah. So I think that's really good. And like I said, I don't want to keep you, but I did have one last question I wanted to ask. Um, What, um, who are some filmmakers that inspire you? What are some, what are some kind of great movies or something people should watch if they're not watching them or, or things like oh, that? Oh man. You know, I get asked this question a lot and I don't know how to answer it. Cause, um, I don't know, man. Um, I, I don't, while I admire many filmmakers, I don't look to them to uh help me with with my point of view i i try the best i can to to be original and not do what you're used to seeing done mm-hmm. so that's my whole thing in life it, 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 when i make my own movies television you know you just have to do what what they give you but um i don't 
you know, I, I because they're all my colleagues, I, I don't, I don't really uh, proselytize anybody. Um, but I, I must say that in my top five movies, which are all from the seventies, mm -hmm. the Godfather one and two are are, are in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if if that has means anything, um, types of movies like that, um, stuff that you just can't turn off when it's on. Yeah. But that's me. That's my person. Some people can't turn off a Christmas story when it's on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Me, I can't turn off The Godfather whenever it's on. I just like, I can't believe it. I go, how did they do this? And mm -hmm. it's just unbelievable what Coppola did. So, but I don't uh, fashion anything I do after anyone. And, uh, you know, I've enjoyed everybody's movies. I've enjoyed even, even Steven Spielberg's movies. I've enjoyed over years, some of them, you know? Uh, others not so much uh i've enjoyed many many uh mm -hmm. films so yeah. i uh i i sorry i don't know i don't have a good answer no, for that no but, that's yeah. fine um no that's i fine. tried no that's <laughs> totally fine i know it was one of the more one of the more generic questions i was trying to give yeah. you some other questions that were a little bit more uh i mean you know you think about it you know we that. have everyone has such varied tastes in everything like Absolutely. you know how you can argue heatedly about the value of some show you're watching yep. and then the person you're talking to just goes ah oh, that's crap i can't watch that you know and you're going what are you kidding me mm -hmm. so it's like you know there's no there's it's really there's so much out there for everybody that you can you can privately love something and and have it touch you yeah. um whereas you know I, it, you know there's so much of it out there that you can't even like no one no one rises to the top anymore because there's so much oh, there's yeah. so much up there so, so much content it's well, well now we call it ridiculous. content we don't even content. call them i know we don't it's even not call even them movie. movies or anything it's i know content. i know and it's who can so even watch different. it all right yeah who can watch it all i yeah. you can't you can't even yeah. keep track no absolutely not. i mean that's why thank god there's a watch list and a plus sign next to everything that you come across <laughs> because if you don't hit the plus sign you won't remember it yep. in a week yeah and I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's great stuff out there we never even hear about <laughs> because yeah. it just gets mowed over in the, yeah. in the, in the mill, right? It's just good. more and more stuff coming out and everything. Remember, I used to be like a trailer junkie, and I'd watch yeah. every trailer that would come out, and now I'm like literally, there, it's on every streaming service, and so I'm looking at trailers on the streaming service. Holy shit, that came out! I got to put a plus next to that, and you know, you just don't. You know, in movie theaters, that whole thing has changed. So mm -hmm. it's really, it's it's just a new frontier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know, uh, I think it was Coppola who said years ago, he said the next great movie will ma be made by like an 11-year-old girl in Ohio or something like that. But that doesn't seem to have come to be, right? Uh, we can <laughs> all make movies. Um, you can make millions and millions of dollars by dropping watermelons off a tower on YouTube, but mm -hmm. um, nobody <laughs> seems to be able to nail down that what Coppola thought was going to happen that somebody's, you know, somebody's just going to make a feature film that blows everybody away kind of out of nowhere. And it just, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm glad that okay. didn't come true. We don't, okay. I don't, let's, you know, can't there be something specialized in what we do or is it just everyone allowed to be, you know, the expert having done nothing in the past? I guess that's the American way. <laughs> no, I, I get your point. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's a powerful one too, because I think sometimes, uh, um, since we've, we've all watched TV shows, we think we can write one or direct one yeah. or act in one, yeah. or uh, we've all seen a movie. We've all seen Jaws and think, oh, well, I could make Jaws. And you're like, no, you can't, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, or yeah. you, you can't even, you know, you can't even do that. You know? yeah. Well, it's part of just the culture of the United States in that, you know, it is pushed upon everyone that you can do anything and you have the freedom to do anything. So basically there's a lack of uh uh importance placed on on ex expertise anymore because it's expertise is it's a seemingly leaves people out in some way yeah. And you know you can't do that in this yeah. country. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Um, but I think it, it, I think it is an ancient problem though, because I think I remember reading uh, uh, something from Plato where he was saying, um, you know, he was like, is uh, like is playwriting the only 
uh, the only form of uh, expression that people think they need no experience at because the guy who throws the discus has to do it for like 20 years. <laughs> but anybody can write a story. Anybody can and can mm. put on a play or something. I think it was either uh, really? it was either Plato or Aristotle, I think. Wow. Uh, it might have been Aristotle. But the quote was something like, is that the only art form that needs not practice or something like that? And um, well, at least it was a question, though. Yes. <laughs> Maybe he was complaining as well. You know? Yeah, I think he was saying, yeah. look, I just sat yeah. through like eight terrible plays. And right, right, somebody, right. <laughs> you need experience to do this. You need experience yeah. to do this. All right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, yeah. Oh, sorry. Did no, you... no. I was going to say when I came into the f- business, the filmmaking business, you had to prove your worth to get the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I exit the, the television world, I, I don't think you need, there's no proof needed anymore. There's, there's just a whole lot of like, we'll take you, we'll take you, we'll take you. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's changed in my lifetime. Yeah, so. absolutely. All right. Well, I don't want to take any more time, John, where can people find you find some of your awesome films and stuff, stuff like that? Yes. My website is putchfilms.com, P-U-T-C-H. F-I-L-M-S, putchfilms.com. And on that site will be links to my trilogy, my independent films, you know, all the work I've done and a little background info on me and some links to other other sites that include my father's website from his theater, my mother's uh, life website and, uh, you know, any other stuff that I deem important uh can be found on putchfilms.com and i am available uh you can click an email link and and get to me because that's me i'm i'm a regular dude and uh that's probably the best way and uh the films are all on there and there's all trailers you can watch and i recommend looking at some of them because all of the independent films uh on my website are made were made for less than a hundred thousand dollars and uh everyone got some kind of a, a it, it wasn't free it was it was people got a little money to do it and uh, i'm proud to have made them and uh, everyone had a good time and nobody wanted to you know leave or be upset so it was a good experience so that's on my website that's great. And I will put a link to your website in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. So anybody who's listening right now can head over there and check out that link if you happen to miss it. Well, John, I could ask you like 10 million more questions, but I, you've been very generous with your time so far. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming on the show today. My pleasure. It was a delightful time. Thank you very much. All right. There you have it, guys. Oh, my goodness. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John today. Oh my goodness, I fanboyed out. Please excuse me if I went overboard, but I love Menden and more Doc, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned during the interview. If you want to learn more about John and his work, please check out the show notes at dicegeeks.com. I have put links there to John's IMDb page and to some of his movies. Um, Please check those out. Also to his website. Please check those out. His work is phenomenal. It is incredible just to see um, the work of a professional storyteller since most of us are amateurs at this. (laughs) Um, It is just incredible. Again, those can be found in the show notes at dicegeeks.com. Please go there and check it out. Learn more about John's work. All right. If you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You'll get some free stuff to help you with your games. Also, if you would like to support the show, you can do so by like, rating, reviewing, and subscribing in your favorite podcast player or app. If you would like to support the show financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash dicegeeks. All right. Now, guys, until next time, keep gaming.